Yes, sir. Another Sunday. And a very special guest today. The the <laughs> one, the only, Danny Carey. God, Danny. <laughs> Honored to have you, have you here today. Great. Great to be here with you, man. It's been too long. Yeah. <laughs> What are you up to? You're out. You're out in in uh, in Malibu. Malibu, yeah, out in Malibu, out here, uh, just hanging with the the family and the sunshine. It's finally warmed up. It was kind of cool the last few days and windy, but it's it's nice today. Uh, enjoy. That, that was cool. That Malibu actually stays so much cooler than the rest of LA. It's almost like yeah, at least ten degrees usually. You know? yeah. Sometimes it's even cold out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right in July. Not like you're, you're gonna go out. Yeah. So you were just chilling out east for a while? Yeah, I just got back actually four days ago, something like that, from uh, from Michigan, like way up north, like almost the UP, you know, like in, uh, out in the woods and the lakes. Out and, in the booms? Yeah, fishing and looking at all the wildlife. And it's it was a great time, man. Do a little water skiing and hanging out on the on the lake life, you know. Building a studio, which was really cool. You know? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't look like you take any time off because I saw that you have your your rig out there. Yeah, so well, I've been trying to take advantage of this time away from the band to kind of develop some new chops and things. I have something to offer next time we get in the room together, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, I can only imagine that um with the way that this year turned out, I mean, you guys were pretty much just almost at the beginning of what was it like a 40 day tour? Yeah. Well, we, we got in some pretty good touring luckily right yeah. after the new year. And then, uh, yeah, come March. I mean, we were just taken off on about a 10 show run and then we were going to have a little break and then start the biggest American tour we've ever done. So that was a heartbreaker when all that hit the fan and, uh, so we're just kind of in suspension now. We have dates held in November and December, but it's highly unlikely that's going to pan out. It's kind of we're kind of at the mercy of the NBA and the NHL at this point. If they start having games, then we'll get to tour because it's pretty much the same venues we do our gigs in. Um, it's and we're we're waiting and hoping. You know, if not, we've got some stuff held over in Germany and all over Europe in January and February. So I'm hoping that'll come through, if nothing else. You know. I mean, it's got to be something where you guys are such a physical entity to play your set that you know you gear up to to do this thing and you're you're in the prime position, and then it's like okay, hurry up and wait. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Now, I, now, like I said, I've lost my blisters. I'm out of shape. It's going to kill me if we, <laughs> we get back into it. You know, it, it takes a good couple of weeks for me, you know, just the physical part of it to get back in there and let alone the mental thing. And, you know, I kind of, it's hard for me to listen to myself. So, you know, I have to re remember all the songs or listen to them, you know, kind of learn them again, even at this point, maybe. I guess we'll see how it goes. But uh, it comes back quick, always, you know, and then hopefully it goes to even a new place you know that's the the hope anyway <laughs> that always happens right every time you come back after you haven't played you find you play it maybe even a tad differently yeah yeah it really d depends for me like who i've been hanging out with like you know if we start jamming all the time that'll have a big effect on my <laughs> or if i'm at the oh. if i'm at the baked potato playing with the jazz dudes you know every everything feeds into it you know especially on the and the improvisational parts more so than on the real structured parts, of course, but, uh, but it's good. It's, you know, I like to try to keep as much input, you know, gumming, you know, so it's a different yeah. experience all the time. You know? I mean, it's a mind blowing experience to go see you at baked potato and, and then, <laughs> you know, you set up your own gear, you tear down, you do your, it's like, it's a lot of work for the, what you do. And then you know, <laughs> wicked set, and it's like quite often it's like, not the easiest of sets and yeah I, it's kind of a different experience it's it's demanding in a different way kind of for me like the physical plane is not you know i'm not huffing and puffing and sucking wind like i do at a tool show is that's i mean i'm really hitting hard there i can't really hit that hard in that room but uh it's kind of more taxing because it's almost all improv you know so i have to be you know have really big ears and be on top of everybody and try not to you know 
step on people's toes and stuff, you know, it's so, so spot on, spontaneous, I guess, but uh, something else but, uh, it's fun, but yeah, I, I kind of stick to moving my own gear and stuff just to keep it real. When I do those kind of gigs, you know, and it's good. I think it's good for me mentally, you know. As a listener in those situations at the, at the potato, I find that I can't pick up the, uh, it just sounds like you guys are just super well rehearsed. And I start thinking, well, wait, when are these guys able to get together to rehearse? And I start thinking like, what is the language that enables you guys to play? Um, is it like your initial training in life is sort of like came from like jazz and like the whole approach of thinking in a jazz perspective instead of a rock perspective that you can pick up on those? Yeah, and there's there's sort of rules that apply, I guess, you know, and, you know, and a lot of those tunes, like, there's sort of standards in that world in a way, you know, I mean, well, Doug, you know, of course the originals are, but they all sort of have this framework, you know, you play the head and the, through the changes and all that. And then, uh, and then everybody just takes turns jamming over that form, that framework. And then because we've done it now for over five years or whatever, you know, we can kind of anticipate the way people are going and things like that. You know, it's just kind of a, it is a language that you sort of pick up on and it develops within different members. You know, they, you kind of invent your own language among yourselves, you know, as a group. And it's been long enough now that we're starting to get pretty good at it, I guess, you know, but yeah, we've never rehearsed once. <laughs> I'm I'm some, some people are reading sheet music. So is it, is it that, is it their their transcribed pieces to some people for some people or, or? Yeah, well, for th I would probably have to if I was operating at the harmonic and melodic level. You know, for me, yeah. it's just if I if I can hear the tune and know it, then I can play it. My hands will do it, so I don't have to practice or something. But and and it's more about the feel the and generating the, you know the the soil, the fertile ground for all that stuff to grow in. That's more my job. So it's not as difficult. But uh, yeah, just to remember some of the chord changes and the possibilities, I think those guys need charts, you know, just see what inversions are going on and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> who, was the, who was that keyboard player on that last Doug Webb performance that was... Uh... Oh, Mitch Foreman, yeah. Mitch Foreman, man, that guy was like... He's the real deal, man. <laughs> I love him. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen you jam with, you know, of course, uh, a bunch of amazing people there. It seems to change from time to time. Um, Lance Morrison, Matt Rode, John Ziegler, uh, Jamie Kahn, all these guys that um, regularly roll in and out of there. Is yeah. this, this is, this is Jamie's like a fantastic guitar player too, man. And he, he kind of puts, I usually play once a month with him when that's the potatoes happening. And then once a month with Doug and the Doug one's a little more toward the legit jazz side or something, a little more straight ahead into the jazzy side and where it's more kind of fusiony and rocky and stuff when I play with Jamie and those cats, you know, it's, it's neat, you know, man, I love playing with Jamie and he, he does both bands too. So we're getting really tight now. You know? Yeah. If somebody comes to LA and thinks that, you know, they've got nothing to do one night and you know, the potato option is up, man. So I highly recommend it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a legendary <laughs> being in someone's bedroom and ha seeing a great rehearsal from, you know, a band that's like right there with it, really not too much PA, sort of like more. Yeah, more, yeah more. it's kind of like playing in your own living room or something. You know? I never have to have monitors really, you know, it's great. I can pretty much just hear what everybody's doing and it keeps it, uh, keeps the communication level really high. It's just pretty necessary when you're doing that kind of music. That's, that's pretty rad. I really thought that Volto was, you know, I mean, it's not, not to say that they're not big, but I mean, not as big as Tool, but I actually almost thought for a second during when you made the Incentier in, in album, say it. right? But that seriously, there would be a contender uh, be like, oh man, it's like the new kind of like jazz tool or, or like fog tool. I know, man, it's it's kind of a bummer. We just, everybody had so many commitments. I know if, if we could have put more time into it as a band, I think it would have taken off a lot more than it did, you know, but it just everybody, it's so busy, you know, it's hard to find time to really develop it other than just showing up and playing together, you know, so it kind of suffered. I think it's popularity suffered from that. But um, it was really an enjoyable experience, man. I hope John's working, you know, I think he's taking students again now. Our guitar player for you guys out there, he, uh, he had some health issues or whatever, but he's, he's getting better. And I think he's, uh, 
like I said, he's teaching and playing. Hopefully he'll be down there at the Tater soon. Yeah. Yeah, everybody misses John a lot. Big up to, to John Ziegler. Yeah, no, I thought that album turned out great. And and hearing it over your at your house that night, the night you guys were listening to it, I think that's a few times I've now I've been over at your place where you debut the album on the, <laughs> on the system. And it's just, it's, it's the way to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. That's really, where we recorded it, so it better sound good there, you know. <laughs> really a cool time, but. I remember getting to hear the, I think it was some download or puppy mixes that, you know, at your house, they've never sounded better than I've been hearing them at your place. That's for sure. It's just like where it's meant to be heard, you know. Didn't you come come over here and listen to, was it like 10,000 days or something like that before? Yeah, I think I did bring some of that before stuff. Before you were going to it, you wanted to hear it in the studio. I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love those little KRKs you have, man. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> anytime you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, so man. let's go back in time a bit and like um talk about like uh, kansas way back oh, wow. way back in time lawrence kansas <laughs> cool. is it true that you saw a skinny puppy play in lawrence kansas sometime in the in the early early, early yeah early, it was uh which show that was i think it was Last rights. It was, it was the, either it was last rights or maybe it was the one before. What the one that had tormentor and that stuff? Too dark par. I think Too dark, was park, dark yeah. park. Yeah, I think that was the. It was one of those that I saw. I think it was a Liberty Hall in Lawrence, Kansas. Man, <laughs> arguably, I could have had a bigger drum kit than what you have now. At that. <laughs> yeah, that was bombastic. Was all around, right? Yeah, he had like a fifty-five gallon drum or something, and all this shit. <laughs> that was pretty impressive, man. <laughs> it and sounded it, monstrous, man. Like back, Dave Rave was killing it for you guys back in those days. I remember, man. I was, I was totally awestruck. You know, man. you know what I remember from that show is that somebody picked us up and took me to Stull. Oh, <laughs> the it's gateway like, to hell. Have you ever been to Stull? And you're like, no, no, no. Okay, we'll hop in the car, and y'all hopped in, and and it was like that. Um, well, look it up online. It's, 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 there's a long story about this church and this the, the surrounding area. Did you guys ever go out there? And man, I never did. I always wanted to go, and I just I, you know that's so funny. You know, it's like I guess the people in Paris never go up the Eiffel Tower or something. It was right in my oh, backyard yeah. practically, and I just never did make it over there. But man, it, it was it has pretty notorious gateway to hell or something. Like hell. That's what they say. Well, <laughs> in some ways, you know. Um, I can say that there was a lot of bad luck after that. But. <laughs> really, I was going to say, did you have any weird vibes when you actually went oh, out there? And almost there? certainly. Um, so when <laughs> I stepped out of the vehicle, the first thing that I saw was a black snake. A literal oh, cool. tall black snake. It was like, <laughs> no Classic. way, it couldn't be. And so, yeah, it had a few warnings on it. And um, wow, I don't know, it was also a, 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 a good memory, though, so. Wow. Is the church still standing there? It was at that time. I believe it's gone now. I think they've taken it away because it was being desecrated and desecrated. But yeah, I don't think I'd want to build my house on that spot. (laughs) No, I know. And then apparently, um, yeah, not only a gateway to hell, but the rumor was that the stairway in that church was endless. That if you tried to go down it, it was endless. So Oh, like, a, um, like an I Escher painting or something. <laughs> I think Ogre and Dwayne tried to go down, but like, uh, I don't think they went too far before they just started getting scared. Wow, that's heavy. <laughs> so what what was your original inspiration when you were in Kansas to get rolling into music? Was it was there some impetus seeing a band or? Yeah, well, um, you know, yeah, I was I just there wasn't much else to do in the Midwest, you know, and uh, my dad always had music and stuff playing around the house. So I was always exposed and kind of had an ear for it. He played classical and jazz stuff all the time in the house. And then, um, was he a musician? He played sax. Some, he wasn't a professional by any means. He was, he was closer to being a professional golfer, actually. <laughs> really good golfer. But, um, but it was great. He, so when I started developing my love of music and, buying rock and roll records he was always real supportive and i really wanted to start playing the drums and he you know helped me buy my first two kits and all that and paid for my schooling and the minute i he was kind of a military guy so the minute i wanted to take it up he's like well if you're going to do this you're going to do it right and he found the best teacher in town and i had to report to him once a week and that started when i was 
got, I guess, 10 years old or something. So I studied until I graduated out of UMKC, you know, like went through four years there playing at the conservatory of music and all that. So that kind of established my, my base to go from, but I, I just wanted to rock and it was more of a legit a jazz school or something, you know? So as soon as I possible, I, I saved up money and moved out to LA and all my dreams came true. <laughs> was that the syncopation book that they had you studying back then? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. God, who, I, that's, that's like a Bible or whatever. The other one is a, uh, Oh man, I don't have here. Oh, this one here. <laughs> the Sink of Patient book, and then this one here, <laughs> the Advanced oh, right, yeah. Modern Driller. <laughs> this, this is yeah. like, I actually started working out of this again, you know, because, you know, I've gotten kind of rusty on some of the technical things. And, and it's nice when I'm on my own just to practice, keep things in, tuned up in a way, you know, and also. I don't. It's funny. I, I when I'm reading books and stuff, you know, I'm not a very good reader, but I'll I'll work on ideas to the point where I'm getting kind of frustrated or something, or I'm trying to play all of them backwards with my left hand now or my left foot or something, and then then it just kind of opens doors all of a sudden, and I'll just jump out of the book and just rip an improv, and then a lot of times new I that's how I get new ideas, like just through kind of shredding or practicing and something kind of formal, and then kind of going ah fuck this and <laughs> cut loose and then different things pop out you know it's, it's works really good for me usually you know has it so been just basic i guess it starts off with just basic snare drum practice with right lefts and lefts rights and combos and stuff like that of paradiddles and all sorts yeah. of <laughs> what what is it that makes it sort of like at a certain point invaluable to gain that sort of dexterity on each limb separately is it just endless practice yeah it's uh well it opens you up you know i never wanted to be the weak link when the you know the conversation is coming from a pretty high level or you know contributing to the songs like it's kind of my job more so since i'm not really operating harmonically or or melodically to uh just to make sure i can push rhythmically as far as i can and, and like and actually try to kick my bandmates in the butt you know and try to throw new ideas at them and throw polyrhythms and things over the top of what they're playing. And then that kind of opens pathways to, for the composition to grow in different ways. And that's, that's the emphasis I try to keep in mind when I'm practicing because you know, you don't want to come in and just start playing some exercise over what somebody's doing. You want to right. be able to embellish the tune in the way that it's talking to you or and hold the conversation with the other guys without bringing the level down rather than tr try to push it up higher. That's, that's always been my goal anyway. You know? And then like, and also I think it's always a drummer's role to like, if you have two different parts to try to lead them into each other, you know, like have enough nuances and things where you can play the three idea coming up over the four or things like that, you know, to make it more seamless and cohesive, you know, goes a long way. You know? Does, does that all start from, say, somebody having, say, a, a section that they that they introduce and then the others get to, say, um, apply uh, something that they, they feel on top of it? Is this something that comes over 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 a, t a period of time? Yeah, lots of it's it's a slow process for us to compose our tunes because we really don't have a songwriter like a mm -hmm. you know, like a Neil Young or something like that. You know, we we just get in there and jam. And these jams can take off all these different directions. And that's when we're all kind of pushing weirdness on each other. And a lot of it's worthless, but we always keep a tape rolling the whole time. So then we just find the cool bits and go, wow, this would fit good with this. You know, we, we there's crazy stuff that we all take the tapes home and listen to them and then show up the next day and then have a little meeting sort of, you know, talk about how that's going to develop or what direction it can go. And, yeah, sometimes it's different time signatures or whatever can feed into other ones. And it's it's weird. It's always hard to kind of figure out how things fit together, but they do. And then I think it's almost like commitment. If we all are feeling it, then we can make it fit together, you know, or something. It's, a, it's definitely a band vibe that makes the songs come together in the end. And you know, all of us feeding into this pot and uh it's it's a good process, but I I wouldn't recommend it to the faint of heart by any means because it's time consuming and it takes us a long time to write. But 
this, but, you know, it's our process and it sounds like us in the end. So I'm happy about that. Yeah. And it, it also fits into your concept of sacred geometry and um, the whole sort of um, ties to say the universal hexagram and these type <laughs> of um, elements that can uh, be associated with a language or um, some sort of, um, do we say spirituality time? It all <laughs> together in some form of energetic uh, energy connection. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's it feeds into it. I've always been kind of inspired by certain arts and geometric shapes and things. And sometimes, you know, you kind of get visions in my head or something like certain time when things are in a certain time signature or something, or you see possibilities of layers going over each other. But uh, I guess it's sort of synergistic in a in a way where that you can look at a painting and paint the space between you and the painting or play the space in between, you know, something like that. You know, that's, I try to do that for inspiration sometimes as much as listen to other music. I like to try to get it out of like visual art things and stuff, but it's a, it's tricky. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but certain things strike you and then off you go. <laughs> Did you find that when you, um, you worked with Alok, um, and getting the tabla deep intensity ins instruction from one of the masters uh, that that even opened up another doorway of like sub timing or sub structural. Yeah, timing. yeah, that's Sometimes. that definitely helped my. I think the polyrhythmic thing and in, in some of my playing because uh, a lot of their thing they they invert rhythms even though like over the same time or they they have patterns that go over like playing over the bar line you know you can call it like playing the five over four and then right. and the confidence to do that in it while you're actually jamming and trusting that you'll be able to make it meet again you know that's a lot of good ideas come out of that and that's kind of what i got out of the indian thing being able to play over and trust the cycles that will come around and meet again you know? so it's it kind of that stretched that part of my playing probably more than anything else that was the big benefit i think i got from playing with a loco it's kind of endless i mean I, I feel like i could go back and start taking more lessons from him as soon as possible you know but i don't know if he's teaching right now through this craziness or not you know? <laughs> yeah um so i guess you can never stop learning on that level yeah that's for sure yeah, yeah. so when you first came to la you were, you told me once that you were playing you had to be playing for a television shows and uh sort of like oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Just, I, I was just kind of i was just going through the la weekly or whatever the music connection you know just looking at every audition i could get you know and i i usually got them but in the meantime you know i kind of met a few different people and uh and i had a delivery job with a bass player that um, played with carol king and he got me a gig playing with carol for a while and then that band we for through that band some of those guys played for some sitcoms and stuff like that we weren't really like a like a david letterman band or something but they when they shoot before a live audience they have a band there a lot of time to keep the energy up so while they're moving the cameras people aren't just sitting there bored or whatever they go well, let's play a high energy song you know <laughs> it's really a funny gig but it paid okay you know and there's always craft services and stuff and we were all starving musicians so it was great you get a free meal and do that once a week you know while they're they're shooting the episodes or the season it was it was a pretty cool gig actually when i think back now it came at the right time because i i didn't i was able to first kind of start paying my rent from my art at that time which was a really satisfying but then um, yeah, after it wasn't too long after that, playing for two of those three of those shows, and then playing with Carol and Jeff Buckley and some different guys, and then I met the guys in Tool, and then that just took over everything, you know. That was Green Jello at first, wasn't? It? Wouldn't that the first uh, version of that be? Well, part of, they, that was kind of going parallel. I, the Green Jello guys lived next door to me. And I was playing with them, and then Maynard moved in with them, and that was how I met Maynard. Yeah, that's he just, I don't, I'm not sure how he ended up living with those guys or who he met the move in there, but uh, lucky but it worked out great. You know, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you were known as uh, Danny Longlegs. Yeah, yeah. I think it was from the the multi-limb thing, the octopus comparison, or something. You know, like the eight 
arms and legs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that was good times, man. Yeah. When did you see that like somebody had you, you all of a sudden had like the bits together to form like another band tool? All of a sudden you knew that you had the components. It was, it was pretty immediate. Like Maynard was trying to put together some kind of a band and I was just I actually I was I was so busy just doing all this stuff and I just didn't know if he could sing or anything. And I I had the space that had a PA in it, so I would rent it out to bands, you know, to help pay my rent over at the loft at that time. And he rented it out a few times and he'd have friends come over and jam. And it seemed like their drummer was always flaking out. And I go, well, man, you booked the time. You got to pay me. <laughs> and then I, when he had uh, Adam and Paul Demore come over the first time, the drummer flaked out, I guess. So I, and I felt kind of sorry for him. I go, well, my stuff's set up. So I'll, I'll, I'll just play with you guys today. And the minute I heard that, I just went, whoa, this, this is something special. You know, man, I'm, I feel really lucky that I had the ability to recognize that, you know, yeah. but I just, it was a feeling that was the kind of music I loved. It was heavy, but it still felt like I could just go any direction I wanted. And they were all open to it and great guys to hang with. And we just became friends. And it, Do you know it, what it was you heard that made, made that connection right away? Was it something about Adam or was it something about Maynard? I think it was just the combination of the four of us, you know, there's that chemistry or something, you know, it just felt right. And it, yeah. and it sounded heavy and powerful too. Adam's had, Adam had a great tone from the beginning, even yeah. one weird gear he was playing. I don't even remember what he had, like an old Randall app or something, but right. it was just the vibe. I think, you know, and it, it's kind of, you know, like Jimi Hendrix could pick up any guitar and just blow your mind. Or it was like, we could have had anything we were playing on. I think it was just where we were meeting was the right thing at the right time. And it felt really good to all four of us. So it was instant musketeer kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I remember in 1993, I was out at um, Lollapalooza in Chicago and uh, I was hanging with Tom Morello and he said, Hey, let's go. You got to go check out this band tool. And I'm like, Oh, we went over to the side stage where you guys were still on the side stage and man, you guys fucking ripped it. God damn that drummer. Holy <laughs> wow, that's really nice. And I hadn't met you yet. And um, it was cool because uh, Maynard still had kind of like a semi Peter Gabriel era hair. Yeah, right. right. Uh, it, was, like, it was it was it, it, a Mohawk mullet or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being that, that was the time of grunge. It wasn't it wasn't hitting at grunge, like grunge. It was hitting like like heavy fucking, you know, a new, a new type of heavy. Cool. And, um, <laughs> it was, it was something I, I never did forget. That's for sure. But, um, you know, soon thereafter, I got a chance to meet you in Malibu when we were uh, recording out there with the process. And uh, I guess right. we've yeah. Yeah. known each other for like 27 years. At since. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm right down the street from that place. Man. Yeah right down from zuma man were you man, that was a memo that was a dream come true man just meeting you guys though that and i was i was just a huge fan you know <laughs> it was amazing yeah. you guys Good are fun. always so nice though i mean uh <laughs> you have to take the war the award danny for one of the, the nicest <laughs> most humblest guys in rock <laughs> I, mean, I was saying to paul barker that maybe <laughs> he might take second place to your first place but you know you're pretty well, close uh, that's nice of you man yeah no um, always a pleasure. Um, and to witness over time, would, would, when you moved to LA, did you find that loft space right away? Is that where you first originally it, moved? To? It took a while. I, I I lived up in some little guest house up in Laurel Canyon for a while, kind of like a little garagey thing. And that that was beautiful. It was kind of a nice way to break into the Hollywood vibe because no matter how the chaos down below on the streets, you could go up there. It was just like serene, you know, <laughs> up on lookout mountain avenue and then um i was there and then they, they i think the landlord sold the house or something and we all had to bail and i went down the exact opposite i was like at pico and la brea down in the ghetto man. <laughs> that was that was pretty gnarly but i i spent 300 bucks a month for like a two or three thousand square foot warehouse and i could just play day and night no one cared so that was invaluable just to be able to shed and then also jam with people like i said that i found through lawn ads or whatever and then uh i think i was there for probably another six months or something and 
then I went to another, I moved in with a guy named Robert Williams for a little while over in the valley. He uh, was right down the street from you. Actually, it was like, oh God, what was that? Camarillo and Lancashire or something like that. It was pretty close by there. And uh, he was the drummer for Captain Beefheart. The, oh, wow. Yeah, played on dock <laughs> at the radar station. Yeah. <laughs> I think Ice Cream for Crow, too, he played on. But those, those are great records. But uh, anyway, I, that, he went on the road or something. Then I had to bail. And then that was after that, I was kind of, I found that place down, you know, or found the loft, you know. The secret to, place. Yeah, yeah. It was it was, it's kind of a resonant, cool spot. Cecil B. DeMille had his, uh, his movie studio there, like movies and stuff. Yeah, so everything he did was gold, you know, and like everything we've done there is gold. You know? I, did, I did not know that. Just You mean just that whole building or just that? Yeah, that whole thing was his studios. I, that loft that I'm in actually was his horse stable, they told me. Yeah. That's why it had those double doors in the back and there's drains on the floor. They'd like wow. wash them off. Then they'd after they sh went up into the hills shooting westerns or whatever, you know, back in the day. Yeah. I mean, LA was so cheap back then. It just it seems like it's kind of, kind of like brought forth the art. I thought that you could afford to live and be an artist. And um, yeah, how much of that, of that space that you had, like kind of like was well, like intrinsic in the music as far as like that space seems to almost like, well, last year, or I don't know when it was, you, you called me up and said, hey, do you want to come down and listen to us play our set before before we went on tour? And that was a okay. mind-boggling invitation. <laughs> and so I got to sit there basically uh, next to the guys in the circle. But the sound in that room, and that's about the second time that I've heard that, is mind-bogglingly intensely tight. It is just like at the exact limit where you might need an earplug, but you might not. And then yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've kind of brought the volume down a little bit over the years. <laughs> but I always thought like that room, man, um, I think like Chris Pittman said once, yeah, the room is tour as well. Uh, <laughs> I never feel like um, the building led, lent itself to somewhat of the, of the, of the, of the band's um, musical sort of entity. I think it had to have some play because, I mean, every song we've written has been written in that room. Yeah, and, and it's, that's good too. That definitely is part of our sound. I'm, I, it's hard for me to imagine not having that place, you know. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we we still don't own it, you know, because you have to buy that entire part of that block or something, you know. But I don't know. I'm I'm trying to talk the guys into going together as a band and you know. Oh yeah. Lords or something like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would be devastating not to have that space for me anyway, because I, I moved in there in 1989, so that's been a long time. You know? Yeah, and um, it's a joy, joyous place to visit. I mean, you get to uh, kind of like experiment on pieces of gear that you've actually only maybe seen pictures of. Uh, yeah. And um, I don't know, I mean, most of it actually is even beyond me because I, I've never even had a chance to say, see a Cynthia 100 before or oh, yeah, you know, right. the, the, the booklet that's on the cover of, uh, of the download album. Three oh, that's right, man. That was, that was such a cool thing that you put that on there. <laughs> yeah. Such a work of art, that thing, though. Yeah, it's a monster, man. It'll. I've blown up my speakers with it a couple of times. <laughs> that's for sure. You bet. We need to get some protection with that, man. Yeah. And, and and you've been, you know, smart enough to be investing along the way, and now witnessing that, you know, a lot of the prices on on these these older synths are just seemingly never going to stop going up. Man, that's it's just mind boggling to me. It seems you know, I'm glad I got into it when I did. I would never have been able to afford it, or you know, just I wouldn't have been that extravagant on it now but i've got a i got a new one here man i just got oh, what is that? Show <laughs> <down. me. laughs> it's a uh it's kind of hard the to phoenix see. it's a it's a phoenix yeah phoenix modular those it's things the phoenix crazy. one i i had the phoenix two from that guy that was down the street from you and then i, I got this one just recently from a got a guy back in chicago and uh I was really stoked to find it. It's it's a lot different than the the two. I was surprised how different they sound, you know. But uh, 
supposedly this one might have been a uh, Richard James, like Apexes or something. You know? <laughs> he had some kind of letter from him or something that mentioned that he said, but I I don't know. I'm, I'm, who knows? He probably has so much stuff. You never know what's. I haven't had a chance to jam on one. I, um, John Prashanti has one, and I was able to look at it for a little bit, but didn't uh, didn't get a chance. I've read up on it. I, I'd really like to know what, what the difference is, but I heard that the, um, the waveforms and the way that you can modulate the waveforms is somewhat unique on it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've just got the thing, so I'm kind of just touching the surface of it, whatever, man. I'll... I'll bring it over to your pad, man. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> no, have a good one. <laughs> yeah. Like um, on the new on the new tour, uh, you're you're performing Chocolate Chip Trip with um, a modular and uh, a bunch of um, very cool things going on. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, I think you use one of our modules in there. Yeah, I think there's maybe two or three of yours modules in there. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Definitely the LFO and an oscillator, or, or maybe two oscillators or some subcon ones, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool, man. I love that it's all that, and then Peter's stuff. The the top three rows of it are like your stuff and Peter's stuff, and then the bottom I have like effects, like some uh, make noise stuff, and you know those from some more effective things like uh, flangers and delays and samplers and things like that you know but that's a lot of fun that, i love doing that during the show just because i never really quite know what's going to happen you know it's just like that's the source of uncertainty <laughs> yeah so how do, how much does that track vary per night or is it do you try does it try to roughly morph it in the same regions it's it's I don't, I don't know how to say how much it would vary, but uh, I mean, I, I, the framework is usually pretty consistent. Like I'll start off maybe on my own and then turn on the machine and then yeah. maybe finish on with just drums or something. But uh, just for variety's sake, I'll bury the tempo and stuff. And I'm going to try to do it with a lot of different time signatures. I think on this next run is I, I had it in seven pretty much the whole time this last run we've been doing, you know, so I'm, I'm going to try to mix it up with some 11s and things because I got a, a more sophisticated sequencer now so I can go into a few different polyrhythms and things with it, you know, so that might make it more interesting, but uh, it'll be a, something I, heard, I can develop over this downtime, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I heard, I heard some, um, didn't sound like um, analog stuff coming out of the rack. Is, do you have a sampler in there now too or some sort of? Um, no, the... The analog stuff was probably maybe the wave drum. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm, I have lots of different samples, you know, and stuff. Just yeah. and that's mainly analog stuff I've sampled, like on my pads and all that, you know. But it's but that uh, modular rack is all analog, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a there is a digital sampler in it. Oh, like okay, a, yeah, that's what I thought. I can throw some stuff in there. Like little, yeah. and I use it for what kind of belly things or some kind yeah. of steel sounds and stuff. Yeah. And you're, you've changed the sequencer since the last tour? I did. I got a, got, it's, I'm trying to think of the name of the thing now. It's got the three dials and it's a, it does the most insane polyrhythms, you know. It's, right. It's, I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a normal sounding sequence. And I was like, oh. No, yeah. It's, 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 it's you can make it to where it cycles around a lot longer. You know, the, the one I was using before was just the one that Peter did. It was just an eight step. Right, yeah, yeah. The Milton, I think it was Milton. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. But it's a lot of fun. It's it's that thing seems endless. The possibilities is it's, it's you can put any time over another time in it, and then it it goes crazy. It's some a German guy made it. I can't think of his name now, but that's a beauty, and I love it. The uh, the other time thing you had your hand in on, on designing your equipment was did, did you did you work with vince defranco on the on the mandala drum right yeah yeah it's my uh, my triggering interface and i used a i used a simmons sdx or sdx like that was the sampling one you know like mm -hmm. it was great when the band just started taking off 
that you know the grunge thing had happened and all that and uh, just electronic drums were it's totally uncool uncool <laughs> <laughs> so god these things were like twenty thousand dollars when they're new and i bought mine for like 1200 bucks or something nice you know, everybody was just unloading them man so it was incredible you know man great uh, era so, and i and they were the first ones that the, the actual pad surface could tell where you you hit on the pad besides just how hard you hit or how soft it also had a had zone intelligence so you could and it was based on midi so like one to 127 from the edge to the rim so you could make it pan as you went to the middle or make the pitch change and all that and then uh, that thing became so archaic or you know just old and just not very roadworthy so i just went to vince and go hey man can you make something that will emulate this or do this with function on this level and no one else had done it yamaha roland none of the other yeah. companies ever did that so i had to have vince do this for me and it, and he improved upon it and the pads are more playable and all this but it, he was invaluable man that that's my baby i mean that's that is what gives rise to you know all my crazy drumming african ideas and stuff like that when i'm doing all the tool things and it's it's limitless just because I just run battery, you know, through that. So I can just drop in samples anytime and Interesting. keep developing. I, I just have a patch for each song now. So, and while we're writing, I just think, Oh, this sound, this sound, I can just pull it off my hard drive and throw them into this pad and make it really playable. And make it, it gives it a little more personality too, just to make it where it's not the same every hit, you know, cause of the that playing surfaces like that and it emulates real drums pretty cool or african drums and i don't have to carry around a million different ethnic instruments which is nice you know yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty mind-boggling plus it has some of your signature sounds on it yeah yeah i kind of had to transfer all that stuff over for the for the hits you know <laughs> and it's great that it that that you know well i guess it's did you just sample it then and transfer it over from i the did system? i the oh. that old simmons it had a midi sample dump thing so i actually oh, nice. take all my samples off that it was kind of a it did manipulate them differently so some of them were quite spot on you know but uh that machine had a bit of character to it but it, it's close enough you know like it all worked out i wonder how many of those simmons things were made i i don't even think i ever saw one for sale yeah maybe less than 200 I, I'm oh, wow. sure, you know yeah yeah and then but, when it went it went yeah yeah well they i guess uh Dave Simmons, I, was, I heard that it about bankrupt his company because right? oh, he no. because he spent so much in development and, re, and research on that machine, you know, and he had made all this money from the SDS fives and the sevens and the nine, especially that was the one that was like the the Henry Ford thing, like the, it was only a couple of fifteen hundred bucks or something like that, and they just sold a bazillion of those when Kaja, Kaja Goo Goo was big. And, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then he took that money and put it all into developing this thing but it, in the end he, he the price was it was had to be like 15 or twenty thousand dollars like who's going to use it except phil collins or something you know no one could yeah, afford yeah. It. so he just kind of lost it on that you know did you ever go through the sds5 uh, tabletop era i i did not not exclusively you know but uh but I, I guess I take that back. I was in a band with Chris Pittman like for a little while, and I think I, I just had that. I had real cymbals, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. But I, but I had just the kick drum and all the toms were SDS five. I loved them. I liked the hard ones, you know. I thought it, some people complained and said it made their wrist hurt and stuff. But I after I a while, like, I kind of like that feel of it, you know. Yeah, it was tight. <laughs> it's kind of like I, playing on cymbals, you know. <laughs> open for Roxy Music playing an SDS5 on a Coliseum stage without that adequate That is amazing, monitor. dude. <laughs> oh, that was like, I, I thought like after it was like, put someone on stage and ask them to play tabletops, you know, in front of a, in front of an audience. Amazing. Was that like a, the Avalon type? Yeah, yeah, it was the Avalon tour. Two shows. That's cool. I like that drummer that played on that, Andy Newmark. At least he was on that album. He's he, a good he, kicked, he killed it. He killed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. playing the five over fours back then too, which is kind of oh weird. yeah, right on. Yeah. Which I thought, like, man, he's pulling some risky fills, <laughs> and everyone would just look in there. Oh well, man, you better come back in. And, and no, it was like he was he, he was he was mind boggling. Cool, cool. Yeah, I always dug his sound.
you, you you've used, also been using the 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 original Korg wave drum. Yeah, I I tried using the newer ones. It it gets it got a little thin on me or something. Maybe because it didn't have as much of the analog stuff that gives it that weight. And it's weird. It, I thought the new ones they sounded good when I'd hear them on their own, and then the minute I tried to cut through Adam's guitar or like Justin's bass, it just it seemed like it would get lost too easily. It didn't have the yeah the right frequencies or something, you know. That and I think maybe that the whole analog quality and the FM synthesis that comes out of the old original one. I think it, it does the trick. I, I got, I've used that on almost every tune now, it seems like. Really? Yeah. I, mean, I still have mine, but I haven't used it in a while. And then actually someone's trying to offer me to buy it right now. And I'm sort of like on the fence. So I don't know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> it's I totally like the way you, I saw you do it. Like we use it a few times at the gargantuan low end sounds coming out. <laughs> <this day. laughs> Total like, brown note action almost coming out of that thing. <laughs> you ever played that synth that synth patch that's in there where you press it down and it, it just growls? It's like oh yeah, yeah. you can push on the, the head. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> that thing was wicked. Yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty cool instrument, you know, man. I'm I kind of wish they the newer ones had that quality. It, I think once again they tried to make something that was a lot more affordable. I think originally those things were probably a couple grand or more. They were thirty five hundred bucks when they came out. Wow, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that much. Once I once again I got mine way later. Did you get yours uh, used? Yeah, 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 yeah. How much you pay for yours? Four or five of them now. I think I because <laughs> I've I've gone through one of them got beat up on the road and it got dropped or something. Yeah, I think I'm. I think the most I paid for one was twelve hundred bucks. You know? Wow, that's a good deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They seems like all the ones I see now are coming out of Tokyo. That's about the only time I see any of them for sale. You know, really? In Japan, maybe they. Interesting. These cords over there. Maybe they had built a surplus of them or something. Some of your instruments that I've seen are just so beautiful, and that are, that original kit, the uh, the the stainless Ludwig. The one that oh, goes, yeah, like, those are so good. Those are bad, goes yeah. to what six to 22 inch tom or something like that, yeah, six to a 20 and then 26 six. inch kick drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that thing is a thing of beauty, it's almost like looking at an antique car. It's like you, you, you look at that <laughs> thing and you're just like, oh my god, is yeah. that one of the first kits that you that, that you had? Yeah, I got that kit new in 76 or 77. Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was a big Carl Palmer fan, you know, and he oh yeah yeah stainless steel stuff. So yeah, man, I that was a my pride and joy. I'm glad I, I'm glad I never broke down and sold it or something. So a lot oh, of people so tried to buy good. it. From me. Yeah, I'm so and I got to use it on. I think it was Fear on the new record, you know. Oh, yeah, so it, yeah. It's, it's in it's, it's just like it's it's like one of your buddies, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's got a really unique sound. Those steel drums do, man. It's like I actually used the three little toms just recently. Um, me and Les Claypool and uh, Bill, the guitar player from Mastodon, we did a Rush cover. Of, oh, I of, heard of, it. Yeah, <laughs> and I, was like, I had to get those three, the three littlest toms on that one feel. Like, <laughs> it. it was like sensational. Oh, like, thanks, man. <laughs> it really, it, I mean, you, you know. Neil Peart's not somebody you gotta, you know, easily, you know, fill in for. But man, you nailed it. Yeah. That was, that was tricky. <laughs> I have something here. Oh, I got wow. my own show and tell. So oh, okay. I only have uh, three drumsticks that I have from drummers that I've collected. Wow. One is uh, from Neil Peart from the Twenty One Twelve tour. Oh, no which way. is a Promark Rock Seven Four Seven. That is amazing. <laughs> One is your original. Where are we here? Oh, cool, man. One of the old true lines. Yeah. You know what I love about these sticks is that thing. Yeah, that handle's awesome, man. <laughs> do you still have these on your sticks that, that, that you do with uh I I don't because you're with Vic Firth now. Yeah, I'm with Vic Firth. They have um I can I can kind of show you mine now. It's um I don't know if you can see it on here or not. It it goes in a little bit instead oh, yeah. of out. Yeah, there's oh, yeah. like a little groove. It, it's kind of hard to identify. Oh, I can see it. That looks nice. Yeah. But it, it, it kind of gives you the same advantage, like when your hands get sweaty and stuff. At least there's something to hang on to. And I, yeah. I kind of went to them. I said, hey, can you do the, the true line thing? And they um, they said, well, it's 
it's kind of wasteful, you know, being, you know, an eco-friendly company. I can because that have the biggest part they have to make this the stick that big, start yeah. the that big. Wasteful. And this way, the biggest part is the butt of it. And um and it I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I, I didn't have much faith in it, but it was really cool because by putting the taking away down here instead of adding on it kind of transferred more weight out into the the front of the stick so it's oh that's interesting a, a we'll have to try one of those it felt good i and i didn't expect that at all you know it was kind of a i stumbled on it and you know, just from experimentation but uh, it's kind of a new danny uh, carrot type invention again yeah yeah right, there you go yeah the third stick i have uh <laughs> see if you can guess who this sticks from wow man Slayer or something. <laughs> that thing's chewed up, man. <laughs> okay, here's a clue. It's in German. Oh, no way, dude. Is that like FM Einheits? Yes, it is. Good job. <laughs> yeah, you got it. I knew it. I love those guys. <laughs> yeah. well, that was from a, one of the shows where it was just like, you know, mayhem, where they just had the steel and all this shit flying. Yeah, that was probably one of the most impressive things I ever saw. I'm so glad I got to see those guys like oh yeah four times you know man it was just mind boggling man I was trying a powerful sound you know speaking of Neil Pert I mean you you got a chance to meet him and go and jam with him and chill with him uh, jam I, I saw a, a thing where you jam with oh the sun's been burning here uh, where you jam with him and Stuart Copeland I mean talk about a power a power trio of drummers <laughs> yeah that was pretty <laughs> insane you know. I was kind of like, what am I doing here? That was, you know, when I was a kid, those, both those guys were my heroes. I was just, that was, a, that was so cool. Yeah, we did that like probably four or five times, man. Like at least maybe more, I don't know. We just, Stuart liked to hold court at his place, you know, man. And he'd call different players, to come over his studio and then we'd just have freak out jams and drink a bottle of scotch and go nuts, you know. <laughs> that was some good times, man. I really miss that, you know. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to keep in touch with Stuart quite a bit, though. So that's he's awesome. Man, you know, between you three, I don't know. It's just like, oh, well, Neil's passed away. You, I don't know, Danny. I think you definitely hold the crown these days. Oh. <laughs> After witnessing like uh, the um, the show here at Staples, um, I know, I know you you allowed me to come in and sit in on your rehearsal, and that was mind-boggling to be up so close and hear the acoustic sounds, but. Seeing the show the first night and the second night at Staples Center, it was like you were on fire that night. I swear, those, I those, those were good shows. That was a good. That was a good time. You know, we were far enough into the tour to yeah it, that we started really developing the songs, like feeling real tell. confident about them. But it still was sort of fresh. You know, there's that fine line yeah. before you're kind of bored you know, by playing old songs. Or whatever. But that was exciting. You know, those were and it just. To be at the homecoming show, you know, and have all my friends there, like you included, that was that was pretty special. You know? yeah. Did it feel that way though when you were playing it? Was it like, oh my God, this is a good night? Yeah, well, you know, you there's so much concentration, you kind of yeah. feel it when you walk off. You know, you go, wow, that was oh, dude. no train wrecks. You know, <laughs> some of the most amazing fills I've ever heard you do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's just it's just one of those things you have to witness you have to see for uh, for real to to understand and and the just just everything man um all three of you guys like adam just brings like a this like side to it which when you get to know you guys as people the personalities play into the music so much in the same way and you guys are like the coolest guys to hang around and just oh man like, get the vibe <laughs> of like you know you could talk music and stuff like that and there's just like kind of like understand it's almost like the, the, the reason why we all got into music is because you're still able to discuss the same type of love for the same type of playing and the same type of feeling from it it's, it's, yeah it's, i feel like that's where we hit it off you know we've listened to so much of the same stuff man it's like kindred spirits or something i don't know and it's it's so great to meet friends and and work uh, have work relationships you know with people that get it you know in the same way you do it's just the most satisfying thing you know yeah. when you met um justin after paul it must have been it must have just seemed like oh my god how could this be how could this be any better yeah i know that was i felt like we traded up you know <laughs> that was great well, I and mean, then, when that was when we lost paul i was like oh my god this is 
I just couldn't imagine it ever being the, the same or as good or something, you know, and then it, that, you know, we hit it off. We were good friends as Justin's band Peach was open, uh, had opened up for us when we toured in Europe. So we knew we got along. He rode the bus with us and stuff because we got along so well and all that. And then I didn't know if it would work out in the, in, you know, in the musical way, but it really did and, and more, you know, so that was, what a relief, you know. Yeah, sometimes like, um, well, especially again on that rehearsal, you'll hear that, you know, Justin is playing the parts that maybe you thought Adam was playing. Yeah, oh yeah, that happens so many times, man. When I play yeah. stuff, no one can tell who's playing what. You know? can't really pin it down until you actually yeah. see that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. He loves the wall basses, right? Yeah, he's he, he had a Stingray when he first joined the band. And I think when we were recording, yeah, the Anima record, it, I think it was, it wasn't consistent all the way up and down the neck. Like when he'd play his high parts, it would sort of lose power and volume or something. So he borrowed the, God, who was it? Greg, uh, Greg Andrews, the bass player from Failure. I don't know if you remember that band, Failure, man. He, he borrowed his wall and he just fell in love with it. And that was all it took. Now Justin became hooked to walls and the guy that makes them is English also. So Justin yeah. had a good rapport with him and it's been a good relationship as far as I know. I was hoping he would say he was in love with Mick Karn. So he just had to suss it oh, out. Oh, I know, man. <laughs> I've, I've mentioned him to him many times. He's not a fretless guy, though, Justin, is not he? He doesn't really yeah. do the fretless thing. <laughs> he plays those frets well. Yeah. Right. And you've been, you've been pretty traditionally stuck or sticking with uh, sonar drums. Yeah, uh, they've... Well, I always loved that sound, you know, the thick shells and they... Yeah. The high the high toms always cut through really good, and they had plenty of beef in the in the kick drums, and the, that's kind of what I was always looking for, you know. And um, I I just like that thick shell sound rather than like DW or somebody that has the thinner shells or right. you know it's just it's kind of a different philosophy, I guess. But I, I hit real hard, and like the harder I hit, the louder they get. Where if I play on thinner shells, sometimes it's simply you hit harder, and they just sort of choke or something, and it, it's a good feeling. Now I've they've they've totally take care of me i get to design everything i want you know with you know pick the shells the woods and the thicknesses and all that stuff so it's it, all my kits now are kind of one of a kind you know i did i did a thing where i take the the littler drums i thought you know always sounded better when they're thicker you know so i right. got really thick shells on the smaller drums and then as the drums get bigger the shells get thinner oh nice the thinner shells seem to resonate low end a little better. So I kind of make them tapered rather than just make them all the same. And it makes sense and it's worked really well. My new one, I'm, I just got, I got to play two tool gigs on it before the, everything got shut down. Um, Alex Gray actually. Alex came. Gray kit. Yeah. I, so that's exciting. That's so I got set up at our space now though, man. Yeah. That's a full sonar Alex Gray special custom kit then. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're making me another one now. That's um, they, they Al, Alex did scans of all the paintings he did on the shells or whatever. So they did a. They're going to do wraps, so I can keep my ones that he actually painted at home. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's probably take the wild. other ones out and destroy them on the road. <laughs> Put them in a museum. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, I think Adam said that they absolutely thought he was it was a museum quality piece. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's done by hand. I mean, my God. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I feel really lucky that Alex has been involved with this, and what an inspiration that guy's artwork is. You know, yeah, it's yeah, he's been he's been kind of like a teammate with Tool uh, for a long time. Yeah, since since Lateralis, that yeah. was the first one he did. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's been a, been a while. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've always liked uh, Adam's video work as well. I think it works well between like. Um, you know what where adam was taking it and then where where um, yeah it's yeah, adam's so he, he had such a great background in the visual arts you know doing movie special effects and makeups and all this stuff you know so he and he just always has been a drawer and a painter and stuff on his own and it, it gets frustrating sometimes you know when we're working on stuff and justin and i would you know hit something at a jam we're like going, oh, this is the greatest thing you However, this is going to be the hook of this. And Adam, you can just tell he's like seeing images, just like he's in another space, you know. Like <laughs> sometimes it's a little frustrating, you know, because he's just 
there's so much going on like visually for him when he's playing music he's seeing pictures a lot of time i think that's that's just how his brain operates and it's the payoff is incredible man he's he's such a key part of the band and having the artwork so integrated with the music has been our been what got us where we are i think i think it's played a huge part in the, in the success again not till standing in or sitting in the room uh like just a few feet away from the pedals that he was playing and with the amp in front of you oh, yeah. you really get a good idea about a lot of things sitting in that position uh, yeah like i like how little pedals he uses there's a, like maybe three or something yeah he just kind of has his standard thing and his sound is his sound you know now, Man, it's yeah. pretty amazing <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. Justin uses a lot more pedals than Adam, I think, yeah. you know, with weirder effects and things. And some beautiful usage of effects, too. I was like, just a yeah. Yeah. some of the yeah. pitch bendy stuff and, you know, some of like the stuff that he was doing was just, uh, um, I think like at some point it would be great if they zeroed in and did that where you could really see what all of you guys are doing up close. Um, something like the Numa um, video that they made for you that you, oh, that, yeah, yeah. It's so awesome that, that the whole, shows your entire performance of you up close. Yeah, it's, yeah, I just take it for granted, you know, that, uh, that people would, I'm sure, love to see that. It I is. remember I was so stoked I got to go out and play some shows with um, Adrian Ballou and and I got to sit right by Tony Levin, like he was playing a stick. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I was just beside so, myself. You know? That must have been a dream come true, a bit of a goal. Uh, I think, was this not one of your original favorite bands? Uh, King yeah, Crimson? one of them. Definitely. I was really into all the proggy stuff, you know, Genesis and Yes and King Crimson and all that. That's kind of what I cut my teeth on when I got my first drum sets and stuff. I tried to learn all that stuff because the drumming's so interesting. And For sure. Music, you know, rather than just the, keeping the beat, you know. Did you ever drum along to records on headphones? Yeah, oh, yeah. That's how I learned to play initially when I got my first kit. I stole my... Hey. Older brother's physical graffiti record just learned every Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what that, that was really the way to do it. I mean, I remember for me, it was like uh, the Kansas album, and then like cool man. album, and then like uh, <laughs> I uh, love those Kansas records. That guy's a good drummer, man. It was a great record to, to drum to, actually. For, for <laughs> I used to put on a stack of records, remember, on the old vinyl things, and then one would drop. And then oh, yeah, <laughs> keep it going, yeah. <laughs> I wonder how I got tinnitus. It was like uh, classic. <laughs> you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you? Did you lose me? I think I lost your volume for a sec here. Hang on. Oh man, no. Is it back? Do, 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 do. Hello. Uh, I don't think I touched anything. Built-in microphone. Did, maybe my thing started going to sleep or something. Do this. Yeah, here. I got you back. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, sorry about that little <laughs> brain. Oh, <that's> all right. <laughs> so another. I mean, the snares. When I was when I was with um, with you, the snare drums that you always have are quite special. And then one time you showed me a, a snare drum that was entirely made of cymbals. Oh yeah, yeah. That my this guy Jeff Oakletree. He used to be John Bonham's drum tech. Actually, <laughs> he started making drums and a. He did a deal with Piesty where when people, they don't recycle their alloy, I guess it wouldn't work. So he did a deal where he got all the broken symbols that people would bring back or trade in or whatever and um, take them to a foundry and melt them down and make snare drums out of them. So and I got one that's all 2002 symbols. That's that's kind of my baby. That's my favorite one. It's a eight inches deep, but that thing just, that's pretty much what I use my mainstay. Like, on lateralis, I think it was, I first got that drum. I used it on everything pretty much. And then, uh, and then I also have one that's made out of the melted down signature alloy too. And it's amazing. They really do sound a lot different, you know, I guess from the hardness or how much tin and copper are involved in it. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know. What is the Allen Van Cleef kit? His is real, it's, it's is just brass or I think his is brass, but it's it's real similar sound. I just got one of those drums, uh, man, like this week or whatever. From, and it's 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 even heavier than the one I was using before, and I haven't had a chance to 
to really give it their, their, a go. But he <laughs> he's sent me two drums, and the, I used one quite a bit on the last tour we were on, and I, I really loved it. It's a real similar sound, you know, that just heavy metal drum, you know, and has a nice cut to it. But it's surprising they still have a nice warm sound to them, even though they're you wouldn't think it by looking at it, but it looks like a tank or something, you know. But, but that the, if the alloy is the right metal, it kind of can create a warm sound. You, know? you would just think, like by the by the look of them, and also the, the, the metal is that they'd just be twice as loud as a regular acoustic drum. They they are loud. I mean, I I, I usually don't use those when I play at the baked potato, you know, because they could be overpowering, you know. But uh, for the tool gig, it doesn't the balance you know is all taken care of and you know with the monitor man and all that stuff anyway and I, I hit it really hard you know when i'm playing live anyway but that's where i usually gauge my whole monitor mix off of my snare drum i don't put it in the monitors and then i bring everything else up up around oh, up to that drum to match it you know <laughs> how much does your um stage sound uh, resemble the sound that you have in the rehearsal space it's really close i think yeah really i mean we we try to emulate that sound that's that is us you know you've been in that room it doesn't to me it doesn't sound much different when we're playing you know other than trying to fight you know weird reverbs of rooms you know when there's like a 10 second verb in some big arena or something but other than that like the dry sound is really pretty close to what it is you know Dude. Do um, Adams and Justin's uh, instruments get fed into speakers that are coming to you, or do you just hear the natural sound of their amps? I, I feed them in because uh, their stuff is, Basically. especially now, I'm kind of sitting back behind, so they're in front of me and it's aiming away. You know, and it's it's not the volume is kind of there, but I, I need them in there to get the clarity. You know, yeah. So that that makes all the difference to really lock it in tight and hear their attack. You know? Do you have an adjustment control up there that you can adjust if you want it louder or quieter? I don't. I just have to go, hey, man, turn <laughs> tell my drum tech, and he runs over and tells the monitor guy. <laughs> That'd be kind of a nice luxury. I see people have that sometimes, you know, we have yeah. like a strip I or something. I thought it was Shoko guys way back in the day. I'm like, I want a knob. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. Figure that out. Excellent. But on stage volume for us always was, uh, it just got out of hand. Oh, I think yeah. that, that's a fine tune that's <laughs> a fine tune situation. Right, right. So oh, awesome, man. How much um I mean Joe Barisi's been with you guys for quite a while uh, doing do, doing stuff. How many albums has he done with you now? He's done the last two. It's <laughs> spanned a long time, <laughs> longer than we'd like to, but yeah, ten thousand days he did, you know, and then uh and then yeah, this one. But he's he's been amazing man it, it's that's a hard job you know because we're especially come mixing time you know the tracking part you know we can just all trust him because he's got the ears and the patience to get all the, the you know you know everything in phase you know when you're opening up 20 mics on my kit and all that that's yeah. that's that's a really uh tedious it's job i would think i wouldn't be able to, but man in the end he's nailed it and then but so that part's not so bad, but uh, but then come mixing time, you know, we all want more of me, you know, <laughs> and then we're fighting about it and everything. I think I think we've come closer to breaking up over mixing and records than we've ever had in any other situation, you know, because everybody just thinks they know what's best for the song, you know, and it's it's it gets hard. And he's the ultimate, uh, what do you call a. Uh, Middle ground ambassador or, or diplomat. Yeah, he's the ultimate diplomat. You know, man. he says the right thing to cool out when we're about ready to beat each other up or whatever. You know, but and that's that's a big part of that job. You know, for yes, like, you know, it's that's a people don't realize how much how key that is to keep the vibe good and keep the peace. You know, and uh, uh, hats off to him, man. I couldn't do it. No, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I I I couldn't do it either. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a huge job, especially on an album that's um, like your guys, where you're taking, you know, a 12 minute trip. Yeah, God damn. <laughs> yeah, it's not sad. It's just, it's just not that easy. Yeah, to make it interesting and keep it developing one way or another really takes some doing, you know. It, it, he's, he's a big part of it. The albums are 
take it to that other level you know it's neat it's fun it's fun after you know working on a record and then hearing that you know like before you go in and track it you know you have this idea and that's sort of the concept of the songs kind of changes sometimes and then that it makes you grow it makes you play it differently after you've tracked it that's for sure and they the songs kind of grow in a different way after that they become more dynamic and things it's just it's a pleasure you know i love that part of it yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's certainly, um, in the end, uh, must be difficult, like, trying to rein in. Um, does, does he have to go out to uh, Arizona to work with Maynard, or does Maynard fly in to do? He, he tracked some of his stuff out there, but most of it, I think, he, he tracked here with Joe. He, he's, he works so fast, man, Maynard does, so it wasn't a problem for him to come in and just knock it out after we had done all our stuff. But, uh, but yeah, he... I, he did, he did most of it here in town. You know, I think he, he kind of takes our mixes back before we, we had them all finished. We would send him the ideas, the rough sketches and stuff, and he would start working on his ideas for lyrics and things like that out there. But that was it. You know? yeah. Man, the sleeve design on this new album is just insane. Like, I said, uh, <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> What's going on there? That's perfect. That's hey, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> it's it's going to be the new mega group, the 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 Danny Carey trio. Yeah, this is it. Man. Do you I, know I'm five years old? <laughs> already, wow. I said, Kevin, have you you playing the keyboards now? <laughs> Are you going to be the keyboard player? Oh my, right, that's <laughs> hey. You might not need me anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me finish up here, Zola. Okay, Dad. Okay. Say bye. Bye. <laughs> that's one of the best things about hey, bye Zola. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs> I guess that's one of the best things about taking you know the time to make a record is that in the meantime you guys have all had the chance to make families. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's yeah. that is a big advantage. It's that's one thing that's been kind of cool about this whole virus thing too. It's like we just I have like a four month old now. You know, man. Yeah. And, I would have been on the road almost this whole time, you know, and I'm just getting to hang out with them. You know? <laughs> the family, yeah, man. It's, it's like, <laughs> it's been great. Congratulations on the birth of uh, Orion, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that Thank was uh, a. Lo I love their names. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's got a little, little of Ryan's name in it, so it's perfect. Yeah. You know? Ryan. He's Orion Daniel, so we're both in him. <laughs> he's a little bruiser, big guy. Man. So cute, too. I wonder what he's going to gravitate towards. I wonder, you know, man. <laughs> so never know. Keyboards and drums, man. I hope so. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. yeah, the total family spirit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. It's been a pleasure being around you guys and getting to know you and uh, and share the time with you. I think like probably one of the greatest times is when um, you were playing over in Japan with oh. uh, Black Sabbath, and I thought like, oh shit. <laughs> Never, and you were like, "Hey, man, give me the names of your friends. I'll put them on the list." So I was getting <laughs> my friends hooked up on the list, and I started thinking, "We can't miss this." Uh, so, so cool. even though we'd been in Japan like three weeks earlier, we decided we're going to. That's go why you just went over there and came right back. <laughs> we went yeah, to the show, so man. We had such a great time with you in Tokyo. We went out for a classic. Uh, I think we went to one of the craziest places in Roppongi to have like the paddle food. Oh yeah, that place was ruled, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we were drinking at um, the James Bond 007 bar in the hotel. Right. You took us to that wicked kind of goth club. <laughs> then you got the personal tour of Tokyo Decadence. Yeah, you're the greatest tour guide over there. Man. And you know, you made bar size uh, Yukio's life when you dropped oh. bar size. It's been oh. <laughs> institutionalized ever since as being the the, the greatest moment in bar set history. Oh, <laughs> bought over for Danny and Ryan, and they came in, and everyone sort of circled around them, and it was just like there must have been like, I mean, the place only holds about twenty people, but there must have been about forty people in there circled around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was a great night, man. Classic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> classic. We had such a good time, man. Yeah, God, dude, we got to do that one again, some way, one way or another, reinvent it. Yeah. What are you guys going to do in the meantime? You figure you're going to start writing some new material? Man, that's my hope anyway. You know, I've been uh, 
I've been bringing it up with Justin and stuff. We're talking about, he said he's been logging a lot of new riffs and stuff. We have, we had a lot of good riffs kind of left over too, that we can sort of start as building blocks to feed off of. And um, so, yeah, hopefully that um, I'm going to, are you guys still jazz? Oh, I, I did a, I did a record with Doug and Mitch and those guys, the jazz oh, wow. record. Yeah, we, we tracked it. We, we did like 12 songs in an afternoon, just play like a gig, you know, we just played and this guy recorded. So we're trying to get the mix, you know, like dial it in better, you know, it's just, you kind of sacrifice some quality and stuff, you know, when you're just in a room all playing together, all the bleed and everything. But it's, I think it's getting closer now. So that's, I think he's almost with, through mixing. So that's hopefully going to come out within the month, you know. Is that a Joe thing too, Joe Barisi? Um. He's got somebody else doing it, and if if this guy doesn't cut it, I can go, I'm going to call Joe. <laughs> he did oh. such a great job on the Bolto one. You know? Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is that is it? Will that be called the Doug Webb uh, thing? Yeah, I think it's just going to be called the Doug Webb All Stars or something. You know, that's what we go by most of the time. So who did Doug Webb used to. Who did he used to play with? The guy's a fabulous. Uh, yeah, he had a lot of heavies. He played with Billy Cobham for a little while. He played with Alphonse Muzon. Played with Stanley Clark, the bass player. He did. He played with uh, Freddie Hubbard. Like he's a next to Miles. He's probably one of the most famous jazz trumpet players. He played with him for quite a while, I think, back in New York. You know, but a lot of the heavies. He's he's the real thing. Uh, he can read his ass off and all that stuff. He's always working. He did. He played on uh, Family Guy and Cleveland Show <laughs> and all these, all these movie soundtracks and stuff. He's one of those guys, you know. Man. He can play anything. Yeah. Pretty fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so, are, are you still jamming, or are you are you guys getting together, or are you you just stay, staying at home, staying safe? Um, Tool hasn't been jamming. Yeah, we've been just kind of on hiatus here. You know, been, that's nothing's really been happening but i think it's time man. If we, well, especially we kept hoping that they were we were going to get back out so we we're just going to hey enjoy this while it lasts you know but now it's looking like it could go through the rest of the year so we need to get the lead out and start start functioning maybe knock out another ep at least or something like that you know and it'd be kind of fun we've never really done that since our first release done an ep so i thought it'd be kind of nice to do something like that and we don't have a album a record deal anymore we're free agents so we can kind of release whatever we want to release now which is a good feeling you know that's cool i guess that's a good place to be you know at this stage yeah. Yeah. But, you know i oh man just hope that some vaccine or something comes up and makes people feel comfortable about going out again god i know it's just scary you know man like how, how badly it just shut everything down you know it's a lot of people's lives you know but we'll see yeah. i think the vaccine will do it but we'll, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. i guess the best thing we can do is like appreciate yeah as you said the time that you get to spend with your family and uh -huh. like your pets and like just like appreciate like wow you know I, this is like pretty good yeah, yeah, yeah right. and then if you can remain creative during this time too yeah yeah that's that's the hard part sometimes for for me or maybe for a lot of drummers you know because like i said i'm not really a songwriter it's hard for me to keep the fire burning and keep that inspiration pumping out of things but it you know i find ways to work and the synthesizers are helping me in that way just to be able to noodle around on those and get ideas and stuff it's always yeah. so cool uh if given the chance to come and hang out with you down at your studio. So if you're ever, man, I can't wait to do that again, man. We have some good jams over there. I can't wait to play with you again, man. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> and the one thing that really blew me away is on that last tour on the, on the encore, you did the, the gong stuff with the big. Oh, <laughs> the sound of that thing where you are must just be insane. Good. It's unreal. I hope it translates, you know, to the crowd like I hear it, because it's it's devastating. Man. That, instrument, that instrument puts out so many frequencies. It's crazy. It's, I, it was great. They had it out at the Peisty factory when I was out picking out some new symbols and stuff, and I'd heard it. I was just like, oh, i got to have this. Ah. They, they gave it to me, so that was really cool, man. So I, Nothing way. I just try to do it justice. I don't, I don't really know what to do with it. I'm glad you, you said that was cool, like what you heard. Yeah. But. It, it, I'm still trying to work out something more cohesive. Big, big metal thing is vibrating, that feeling. That you can only get from that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that low is just 
it's incredible. You know, get that feeling out of a speaker. That's for sure. <laughs> I think, you know, luckily I was close enough to the stage that I was wondering if I was actually hearing actual, like the resonate, resonating of the, of the actual thing itself. Hitting me. I wonder, maybe, oh, maybe partially anyway, if you were close, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, quite, it's quite amazing. Yeah. I thought that was a, a really cool thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hope I get a chance to see your uh, next leg of the tour, and I hope that comes around more sooner than later for you. Well, you'll be on the list no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Manny, thank you so much for joining me today on a little chat adventure here. Man, thanks, man. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's just good to talk to you, man. It's, I miss you. <laughs> it's been a joy. Keep us, keep me posted as to, to what's going on if you're going to be out and about or around. Yeah, I'm gonna. My my mom was out here for the last week or whatever. But she came back with us. We stopped in Kansas City and picked her up on the way back from Michigan. But she just split. So I'm gonna plan on going in and hanging at the loft a little bit. So I'll give you a buzz when I'm over there. Man. Yeah, you gotta. I gotta get a tutorial with you on the drum machine. Oh yeah, yeah. On the, the, the analog. VW bus lately too, too, didn't you? You were you were looking for a VW bus for a while. Oh right, right, yeah, man. Well, just the VW, the dual, the dual VW crew someday too. Yeah, yeah, yours is beautiful, man. I love that. I love that. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Fifty nine or something, man, or fifty seven. So yeah, we have to the other day to uh, a place by where you live, uh, Malibu Seafood, and uh, sort of like had a fish and chips special day, and man, excellent. Place. I love that place. If I, if I lived where you live, I would be at that restaurant like four times a week. Yeah, we're there at least once a week. Usually. <laughs> Chips? Hard to beat, man, yeah. Yeah, just some of the best I've ever had. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. Well, yeah, sir. man, yeah, for sure. Give a buzz if you're out in the hood. We'll go there, man. Yeah. Okay, I'll let you know next time. <laughs> okay, perfect. Looks like we got, hold on one sec here. Thanks to uh, everybody here on the side that's been talking the whole time. Of, oh, cool. Kind of Brad, Steven, <laughs> Sam, Pete, Tony, Dadabong, Roy. <laughs> All these guys, thank you for tuning in and supporting us via the Patreon. And Danny, have a good day out there. Don't get sunburned. All right. I'm a little late for that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Love you, man. I'll talk to you soon, Kev. <laughs>